The topic for this session is the creation and nature of human beings. And the issue is, what does it mean that human beings are created in the image of God? And what is human nature? The church has always believed that God created human beings in his image and that human nature is complex. That is, it consists of both material aspect and an immaterial aspect. God's nature is simple. God's nature is spiritual. Human nature is complex. It is immaterial and material. Immaterial, a soul or a spirit, and material, our body. So the church has always believed that we are created in the divine image and that we are complex beings. Let's look first at the image of God and how that doctrine has developed throughout church history. And there have been various positions on what it means to be created in the divine image. The most popular and most common view is that the image of God is substantive in nature. It's, it's some attribute. Uh, it's something about human beings themselves, human reason or rationality. The fact that human beings are intellectual beings, so our mind. Or another idea that human beings possess free will, so our freedom. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. Or, or other kinds of human capacities like our, our creativity, our ability to, to speak and all like that. So substantive views of the divine image, uh, these are views that human beings are made in the divine image in terms of some attribute or attributes that they possess. Relational views of the image of God really coming into uh, the forefront with Karl Barth in the middle of the 20th century. Relational views emphasize that being created in the image of God means that we are male and female. So Genesis 1.27, and God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, God created them. And so Bart emphasized the relational aspect of the image of God. We are created male and female, and so human relationality, a men relating to women, this is what it means to be made in the image of God. Functional views have come to the forefront in the 20th century, largely because of Old Testament scholars working with ancient Near Eastern literature and the ancient Near Eastern emphasis on uh, the king being created in the image of God and therefore exercising dominion over the area that he rules. In terms of the divine image, functional views emphasize that what it, me what it means to be made in the image of God, it means that we exercise dominion over all that has been created. And, and these views pick up on Genesis 1.28. So after God creates human beings in his image, he blesses them and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and exercise dominion over the rest of the created order. So functional views emphasize the fact that being created in the image of God is not about something that human beings are, not some attribute or attributes, and it's not relationality, but it's what we do. We are to exercise dominion. That's what it means to be created in the divine image. Uh, more recently, uh, holistic views of the divine image have risen to the forefront. And the holistic view tries to combine these various other elements into a view saying the image of God is, is really all that human beings are. So a holistic view, for example, would emphasize being created in the divine image means that we're, we are created to reflect God and to represent God. Images reflect something. So we are divine image bearers. We are to reflect God's uh, nature, God's attributes in the world in which we live. So that as we look at one another, we get a very partial and very imperfect glimpse of what God is like because we are reflecting God's nature as his image bearers. And image bearers also represent God. We have been given this mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth thus procreation, and to subdue it and exercise dominion over the rest of the created order, therefore vocation. 
So the vast majority of human beings are going to be married, and the vast majority of married human beings are going to have children, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So we represent God, right, through procreation, and we also represent God through vocation, the honor and the dignity of work. Genesis chapter 4 begins to indicate the fulfillment of this mandate to uh, work hard. And so we have people, according to Genesis 4, building cities, uh, taking care of livestock, making uh, instruments of bronze and iron, playing musical instruments. So human beings are designed to represent God through procreation and vocation. These are holistic views of the image of God. So the church has historically viewed the divine image in various ways. But what is human constitution? Of what are human beings constituted? Traditionally, there have been two views of human nature. Uh, and I'm going to say these not in necessarily any order, but trichotomy and dichotomy. Trichotomy, from a word that literally means to cut into three parts, trichotomy is the view that human nature consists of three aspects. There's a material aspect, our body. There is an immaterial aspect, our soul. And another immaterial aspect, our spirit. So we are body and then soul. And soul is usually defined as mind, intellect, reason, uh, feelings, sentiments, and will, the capacity to make decisions and to act. So the soul is mind, feelings, and will. And then the third aspect, another immaterial aspect, the spirit, generally defined as the human capacity to relate to God. So trichotomy, human nature is complex, consisting of three elements. One material element, our body, and two immaterial elements, our soul and spirit. Dichotomy comes from a word that literally means to cut into two parts. And so the position of dichotomy holds that human nature, which is complex, consists of two aspects, two elements. A material element, our body, and an immaterial element, which is our soul or our spirit. Soul and spirit are just different words but refer to the same immaterial capacity or immaterial element of human nature. So dichotomy, human nature is complex, consisting of a material and an immaterial aspect. Throughout the church's history, the church has wrestled with Platonic philosophy or Gnostic thought. Plato and Gnostic thought emphasized that what is immaterial, the spiritual or soulish aspect of human beings, is inherently good, and the material aspect of human nature, our body, is inherently evil. And, and, and so the early church and the church throughout its existence has, has wrestled with uh, how should we view human embodiment. And, and Platonic philosophy, Gnostic thought, in my estimation, has negatively influenced the church's view of human nature. And, and so we see the early church, yes, emphasizing the importance of, of physicality. I mean, God did create a physical universe. The Son of God took on physical human nature, a body. There is the resurrection of the body. There will be the new heavens and the new earth, which are material realities. The, the church did emphasize the importance of materiality, of, of physicality, but also really wrestled, thinking that, is the body inherently evil? Is it the source of our sin? Is our body that which really prohibits us from growing and maturing in holiness through Jesus Christ? And so we see the ascetic movement arising where uh, Christians would deny legitimate physical pleasures like, like eating and drinking and, and sleeping and engaging in sexual intercourse, things like that. And, and even today, this philosophy continues to exert a negative influence on the church. J just think about how we phrase things. We, we are in the business of saving souls, and, and we are about engaging in spiritual disciplines. When was the last time you heard a sermon on physical exercise, good nutrition, rest and sleep, physical realities? So the church has historically wrestled with human embodiment. The major challenge that the church faces today is the challenge of monism. That is, human nature is not complex, 
but it's simple and it is material only. You are only your body. And this view of monism it stems from neurophysiology uh, or neuroscience. Uh, we could take you down to a laboratory and we could connect your brain uh, with two electrodes and we could hook you up to functional MRIs and PET scans. And, and we could direct you to think about a happy childhood memory. And, and our, uh, our devices would detect that a certain region of your brain would become hot. Th that's the long-term memory section of your brain. And then we could say, stop thinking about a happy childhood memory and think about the multiplication tables. Like six times one is six, six times two is 12, six times three is 18 and so forth. And, and our devices would pick up a different region of your brain would get hot because that's your computational element of your brain. And then we could say, okay, enough of the multiplication tables. Uh, I want you to pray and I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so you would go, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And you'd go on and, and our devices would pick up that a different portion of your brain would get hot because that's your faith element. That's the faith aspect of your brain. The conclusion that neurophysiology is coming to is that you are nothing more than your brain. You are nothing more than your brain and uh, uh, chemical, physical reactions between your brain and your central nervous system and your body. Which means that when you die, that when your body ceases its functioning, you do not, you cannot exist. Of course, this flies in the face of biblical teaching about life in the presence of Jesus Christ in the intermediate state between our death and our resurrection, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And, and, and so it, it contradicts scripture, it contradicts the historical view of the church that human beings continue in existence after their death and before the Lord returns. So monism is a very strong challenge to the church today in my opinion, the church needs to hold firmly to dualism, that we are complex human beings consisting of both a material aspect and at least one immaterial aspect. We are holistic human beings. This is the doctrine of the creation of human beings in the divine image and what human nature is and a little bit about the historical development of this doctrine.